webinar Wednesday. Today's webinar is about conforming to IEC 615.11 ONM requirements. And for those of you who are new to our webinars, we usually like to give you a little bit of background about Exeter. We are a functional safety company that also does alarm management and cyber security for industrial control systems, as well as certification for IEC 615.08 products and training. We are a global company uh, with headquarters in uh, Pennsylvania, in the US, and in Germany. Just a little bit about our focus. We operate across many industries in the automotion, automation process industry, automotive and nuclear, and we can provide support for manufacturers in terms of their functional safety management requirements, development support for developing products for 1508 compliance, certification for their products, and we can provide tools with our suite of uh, Excellentia. From the system designer's point of view, functional safety management setup, we can provide guidance on that, consulting, and also uh, provide certification of your procedures and processes, silver education services, and again, tools to support that part of the safety life cycle. From the end user's perspective, here we can provide SIL verification, SIL determination, device selection, and using the tools within Excellentia to support that work. From the point of view of an engineer and contractor, here again tools with Excellentia for doing PHAs, for doing SIL verification, SIL, de SIL determination, SRS generation, and also competence development via our CFSE, our Certified Functional Safety Expert Training Programs. So that gives you a, a fair roundup of our key areas of expertise and uh, fields of operation. We also have a significant amount of reference material. In fact, our, our um, website does contain a lot of free information this webinar, for example, will be recorded and will be held on the website. We have previous webinars we've held uh, are available via the website, as well as blogs, white papers, and a number of books, not least of which is a comprehensive book on functional safety, as well as industry references for automation and handbook on equipment failure data. Just a little bit about the certification side of the business. We are accredited by ANSI for testing, A-class testing. We do provide the um, cyber security and functional safety certificates. Uh, 615.08 certification program for products, both software and hardware, and also for doing uh, ISA secure and Achilles testing. We are accredited by the American National Standards Institute, ANSI. As for yours truly, who's giving the presentation today, I'm responsible for our end-user business globally, as well as our end-user cyber business. I have 37 years experience in safety and controls. I've been with Exeter for this two and a half years, past two and a half years. Uh, I also do some of the functional safety engineering training, and I've uh, published some papers on uh, managing risky projects and also the conforming to operations and maintenance requirements for 615.11. So if we look at the history of the standards, and in particular 615.11, IEC 615.11, this was introduced in 2003 and is uh, what's known as the, the process sector standard, process industry sector standard that's governed by the umbrella standard of IEC 615.08, the main safety standard. And 15.11 was unique in that it was non-prescriptive and performance-based around a safety life cycle, which covers from cradle to grave, effectively, 
the life cycle of a safety instrumented system. It's been widely adopted by companies operating in the process chemical, petrochemical and refining industries and is due for uh, an updated release, I believe, next year. The emphasis of the safety life cycle is placed on reducing risk and mitigating potential for hazards and the primary areas are obviously to prevent the loss of life, prevent environmental damage and to prevent property uh, destruction of property assets for the plants. And the, there's a significant amount of importance placed on operation and maintenance of the safety instrument system. The old adage used to be it was it used to be 20, 20 weeks in design, 20 weeks, 20 months rather in, in implementation, and 20 years in operation. So the majority of a safety instrument system's life is going to be in the operation and maintenance domain. We look at the safety life cycle, there are effectively three phases, three key phases. There's analysis, realization, and operation. And in parallel with that is the requirements for structure and planning and for functional safety management and functional safety assessments. The outputs of which build into the concept and feed stage, the design and build, testing, installation and validation. And then in the operational side, we get into management of change, proof testing, and this would normally be part of uh, mechanical integrity programs within plants to ensure that the safety instrument system is maintained. So this is the area where we're looking at today with clause 16. And if we look at the flow, we can see here that from the SIS safety instrument system operation and maintenance, we need to have operation and maintenance plans and proof test procedures for all the equipment within the SIFs, within the SIS. And this would result in maintenance records and proof test results, all of which are requirements for having an audit trail. So if we look at clause 16, this is basically where the rubber meets the road. And 1511 is very clear that you require a properly and well maintained and defined operation and maintenance plan. And this should include all tests that are required to verify the proper operation of your safety instrumented functions. And don't forget that a safety instrumented system can consist of one or more safety instrumented functions. There should always also be a proper periodic test interval. And this test interval is used during the SIL verification for the SIF. It's part of the, the uh, calculation for the safety integrity level of the SIF. And again, this needs to be properly documented as part of the plan. Developing a safety checklist. The operation and maintenance plan should be a working document and it's designed to ensure that each SIF of the SIS is maintained to meet its safety integrity targets. So this would involve having routine and abnormal operation activities documented, the proof testing, the preventative and breakdown maintenance, procedures, measures and techniques to be used for operation and maintenance, verification of adherence to the ONM procedures is very important because it's, in my experience, when I've been on, uh, in the past and on uh, platforms and into refineries, that's not always the case. There's, there's documentation is always one of the problems. It's never up to date or it's not where it should be for the maintenance people to be able to gain access to it. So that's, it's important to make sure that there is verification of adherence to these procedures. And of course, when these activities shall take place, that needs to be defined. And then the persons, departments and organizations responsible for these activities needs to be defined. So there should be procedures covering each of these needs, especially when it comes to doing updates and modifications to the SIS. As I mentioned, quite a few um, 
end users tend to have mechanical integrity programs or they'll have plant safety people responsible for their process safety management. These would be under their jurisdiction. And the other thing that's very important is to make sure that the manufacturer's safety manual is followed to make sure that the equipment is replaced before the end of its useful life. The old adage of it ain't broke, don't fix it does not apply here because manufacturers state their useful life provided the device is properly maintained and also needs to be replaced before the end of its useful life. So if, if you do this right, these can be treated as a as type of a safety checklist. We look at operation and maintenance procedures. According to 615.11 clause 16.2.2, you have to develop O&M procedures. And this is where routine actions required to maintain the as-designed SIS have to be documented. <coughs> actions or constraints prevent the unsafe state during maintenance. So in other words, what bypasses need to be put into place. Information to be maintained on system failures and demand rate. This is very important. Uh, it is a requirement to document all demands, whether they are spurious demands. In other words, there's a fault, either a systematic fault or a random fault that's created a demand. And also maintaining audits and tests results. The procedures to be followed when faults or failure occur with the SIS have to be documented and also the test equipment used during maintenance has to be calibrated. That's another thing I've seen uh, in the past going into plants is that some of the calibration certificates or stickers on the, on the equipment are not up to date. Procedures to be followed when faults or failures occur with the SIS. This is very important because the maintenance people need to know how to uh, fault find and repair to bring the SIS back to normal operation. Procedures for validation, if there are major changes, you would have to go back and, and perhaps validate that the, the overall SIF and the SIS has not been compromised in any way. Maintenance reporting requirements, those need to be documented, and procedures for tracking performance. The standard is very clear that you need to go to do periodic uh, reviews to see that the SIS is performing to its intended design. And also the test equipment used during maintenance is calibrated and up to date. That's another very important thing. Competency. Competency is a, is a major part of this because competency, if, if people are working on the, the SIS, and they're not properly trained or competent, then there is the prospect for systematic errors to creep in. So 615.11 is very clear that the o &M personnel need to have the requisite skills. They need to understand how the SIS functions. They need to understand how what the SIFs are protecting against and what the overall SIFs is protecting against. They need to understand the operation of all bypasses and when or how to apply these bypasses. This is very important. Oftentimes, in, in the past, accidents have occurred because the bypasses were put on during maintenance and they were forgotten to be taken off. And when a demand came through, the system could not react because the bypass was in operation. Operation of any manual shutdown switches and or startup. Statistically, most incidents occur during maintenance or after maintenance, either during startup or during shutdown. So it's important to make sure the operators are fully trained and understand what to expect. And also what action is required upon any SIS diagnostic alarm. The ONM personnel need to be trained as required to sustain full functional performance of the SIS. This should also include when, when doing retrofits or upgrades. If new equipment is coming in or being introduced, the maintenance people need to be trained so that they understand how this equipment is going to perform and, and what, how it relates to the SIF. 
They have to follow the proof test procedures. This is clearly defined in 615.11 for 16.2.8. <coughs> and that means a proof test procedure has to be developed for every SIF to reveal dangerous failures. Because let's not forget that, as it says, an SIS consists of one or more SIFs, and each SIF can have different proof test requirements because they may have different safety integrity levels. So it's very important to understand and have a proof test procedure for each of the SIFs. And the purpose of the proof test procedure is to reveal dangerous failures. The other thing about proof testing is it's not just a mechanical or electrical test. There should be a visual inspection. So in other words, you need to look, if it's a final element, you need to look and see is there any corrosion, any evidence of corrosion. Again, from the point of view of any piping, or, or wiring, is there anything that's been done that wasn't uh, approved? So any modifications that weren't approved? These things are important to look at. So the proof test should not just include the electrical and mechanical test, it should include a visual inspection. O&M personnel will require regular training and competency audits and assessments. So, as we mentioned earlier, the, the, the new and updated components, or if there are old or worn out components that are being replaced. It's important to understand the equipment and how it operates and also how it's to be maintained. And so, therefore, the safety manuals for those, those pieces of equipment need to be accessible and need to be understood. Because the manufacturers will always specify what you need to do to meet the particular sill. And training records and assessments need to be kept for auditing purposes. These are important things that need to be done. So what happens in practice? Well, the end users are responsible for enforcing the 1511 requirements. Good or bad, I, you know, at the risk of getting a lot of emails from angry end users, not every end user is bad. There are very good end users who are very diligent and who make sure that the requirements of 615.11 are followed. However, and this is the, the sad part, you only need to go to the CSB website, um, that's the Chemical Safety Board website, and look at some of the examples they have there of incidents and, and, uh, and accidents that have happened over the years and, and uh, what the causes are. And a lot of it comes down to safety culture. If the company doesn't have the right safety culture, if they're not committed to making sure that the people that are operating these sites are properly trained, then there is always the prospect or potential to have an incident. The end users have to ensure they have adequate procedures, as well as an adequate documentation and tracking system. It's very important to be able to Make sure that you document and track maintenance and any potential problems or faults. You have to record spurious trips and process demands, as we mentioned earlier. Spurious trips are, in fact, in fact demands on the system. And so the spurious trip rate needs to be recorded. During the front-end phase, during the analysis phase, and the, the implementation, the SRS will have a spurious trip rate for each of the SIFs. And this spurious trip rate is what is assumed to be an acceptable spurious trip rate. If your spurious trip rate defined in the SRS for a particular SIF is, say, once every 20 years, and you've had five already in the first year, clearly there's something wrong, and that needs to be investigated. Failure events too have to be looked at. What caused it? Was it a systematic issue? Was it a random issue? Systematic being that uh, something that was designed in badly or it was due to personnel, of an end personnel, not understanding how to maintain the SIF or the SIS, causing some spurious event. Audit results, proof test results, all of these have to be recorded. It requires O&M personnel to be diligent in recording the required information. Usually, if there is 
a spurious trip or there is a problem, there's tremendous pressure on the o and personnel to get the system back up and running. And sometimes, if they're not diligent enough, corners can be cut. And usually that comes down to documenting. They need to make sure and need to have a strong culture of recording everything that happened. So not just the as left, but the as found. Proof testing. 1511 clause 16.28 requires a proof test procedure to be developed for every piece of equipment in a SIF. So it needs to describe the, what's the correct operation, what are the correct diagnostic alarm and indications. And you need to undertake regular proof testing, as we've already said earlier, per the SRS. The SRS will define for each SIF what the proof test interval has to be and what proof test interval is used in the calculation of the PFD if it's demand mode, low demand. And visual inspections of piping. I mentioned this earlier. It's not just electrical mechanical testing, it's visual inspections need to be done too. So proof tests need to be carried out at intervals specified in the SRS as already stated. There's also a mean time to restore, and this must meet the requirements specified in the SRS as well. So these rates, these, the restore rate and the proof test interval are specified in the SRS. And that document needs to be available to the O&M personnel, whether it's incorporated as part of a, a mechanical integrity uh, system, it needs to be available. They need to understand how much time uh, is allowed for certain actions. So, meantime, to restore is is basically is the once you've detected that the failure has occurred, then you have to re find the problem, either fix it or if it needs a replacement, replace the component and then get the set back up and running. So that time has to be documented. And if again, in practice, we're finding that the MTTR is actually longer than we had specified in the SRS, then that needs to be looked at, and if necessary, the SRS needs to be modified. And personnel need to be regularly trained and assessed. This cannot be stressed enough. There's the, the, the people aspect is what is most likely to cause the problems. So, management of change is another area. There can be a modification request come in. This could be because, let's say, that safety performance has been below target, or we're getting more systematic faults than we had anticipated, or we're getting more frequent incidents or accidents. It could also come from operations or production who want to modify the process. There could be some legislation that requires modification. There could be modifications to the equipment under control, or there's modifications to the safety requirement. All of these could be the reasons for generating a modification request. Depending upon the type and severity of the modification, we need to do an impact analysis study. This may require going back and doing hazard and risk analysis. And then there needs to be an impact analysis report, and then modification design authorization. So each change needs to be in term, it needs to be assessed in terms of the impact on the SIF. It's very important that that needs to be looked at, and that is a requirement in IC 615.11. So how is data recorded? Well, the end users must maintain records that certified proof tests and inspections were completed. Again, that's a requirement of the standard. The proof tests are there to detect defect, defects and or faulty equipment prior to a demand being placed on the SIS. In other words, the, the whole intent of the proof test is to reveal any dangerous faults, dangerous undetected faults. And, and part of proof testing is looking at proof test coverage. How effective is the proof test? And generally speaking, when you, when you get the manufacturer's 
safety manual for a particular piece of equipment and he specifies coverage or he might specify a safe failure fraction, that has a bearing of course on the, the cell determination or cell calculation for that particular cell. And, and the, as in a chain, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And generally speaking, that tends to be the final element. So proof tests and proof test coverage is important, and this needs to be considered. So how is data recorded? Well, you need to have a description of the tests and the inspections performed. There needs to be the date of the inspections recorded, the person who was performing the test or inspection, any serial numbers or unique identifier of the system being tested, for example, the loop, the SIF, etc. Results of the test or inspections, and this is where we need to record the as found as well as the as left. Because oftentimes it's only the as left that is recorded. Because the standard is non prescriptive, it doesn't define how these results are recorded, it just says they need to be recorded. So most records are either paper-based paper or maybe Excel-based <coughs> or even Word-based. I was talking to one customer who was telling me that they have a, an issue because all of the, 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 the proof testing or the results of maintenance have to be uploaded to their SAP system. And the only way they can do that is by having to get all the, the results scanned and then digitally uploaded. Of course, that's very time consuming and doesn't always get followed exactly because of time pressure constraints. So in this modern day and age, this is where technology can help us. So if you have a software-based tool on a handheld device or a tablet, that can save you time and money. The tools should be able to record functional safety statistics and performance metrics. So in other words, this, this includes the demands, whether we've had real or spurious demands on the SIS. The inspection and proof test results. Maintenance activities. Calibration, for example. And any failure reporting. The whole point here is that what you're looking to do is to try and identify if there are any discrepancies between the expected versus the actual behavior of the SIS and whether or not any modifications need to be implemented. This is a requirement. <coughs> Recording demands on the SIS. Recording demands in in, in a terms or in a way that enables the user to determine which layer of protection failed is important. So if there is, if there is demand as a result of an incident or a, uh, a hazard and the layer of protection fails, you need to know that. Because during the HAZOP, the uh, demand frequency was established based upon the acceptable risk criteria. And so therefore, your demand frequency needs to be determined for the hazard scenario. So if you're finding that you're getting more demands than you'd actually originally envisaged, uh, and of course it now means that your, your risk assessment has to be reviewed again, that's important to know that. So the discrepancies between the expected versus the actual behavior can be analyzed and as we saw earlier, any modifications implemented provided these modifications are reassessed. These discrepancies versus expected, expected behavior are a requirement of clause 16.2.6. So let's look at some examples for recording successful demands. Here we have uh, a screenshot from uh, the SILSTAT tool. And this shows you here that there's been a demand <coughs> and we had a low firebox pressure alarm that was successful. 
So this IPL was successful. So it identifies the protection layer that was successful, and any information can be used to determine the demand frequency or the hazardous events. So how often has this occurred? Does it meet the original requirements? Or are we getting more demands than we had originally envisaged? What about what happens when there are unsuccessful or failed IPOs? Here we're saying that we had three fail, but the fourth one was successful. <coughs> so here you can identify the protection layer that was unsuccessful, and you can again use the information to determine the frequency of the hazardous event. Also, plant hierarchy can be recorded. Now, this is useful from, from a maintenance uh, perspective because it enables the physical devices to be stored and identified by tags or descriptions. Managing devices. Here's another example. We have a screenshot showing we have a list of devices. In this case, they're Rosemount tr pressure transmitters, where we have the model number, the serial number, if there was any proof test template, and then whether it's, you know, what is the status, it's, is it active, is it not, and what is the tag. And then you can have a location. So you can specify where, where, the, where this is located. In this instance, we're looking at it being located in the heater. So this will help o and m personnel to carry out effective maintenance and any replacement of devices if needs be. <coughs> proof test generator. Having uh, a, the ability to, to generate a proof test is very useful. And here we have an example where we have a description of the proof test. This is where you bypass the safety function, take appropriate action to avoid a false strip. Then you de-energize the remote actuated valve and follow the rest of the steps through. And then it's, did it pass, did it fail, yes or no? And then you can have any comments related to that particular test. This again helps the maintenance people record the results of proof testing and provide an audit trail to show that the proof test was carried out. That's also an important part of the requirements. Recording results. Here again. We mentioned this earlier that there may be different proof test intervals for different devices within the SIF. And so that needs to be taken into consideration. And if you have an automatic proof test generator, with the pass-fail criteria for each of these particular SIFs, it's very useful at the same time. Here you can see the same thing again. We're looking at a hard communication device. You can see what it's looking for the value. Was it done? Any comments? So recording maintenance activities. Here you can see the type of, of uh, activity that was being undertaken. Here you've got, it was it reset, clean, re did we clean it, recalibrate it, repair, commissioning, etc. And you can define particular activities and record the results of those activities. So again, it simplifies maintenance and it provides the ability to quickly locate devices and effect a change. Another example, we can locate the device, we can enable the recording of the as found and as left conditions. So you can document, okay, we found that the device had, had some excessive corrosion, or there was leaking, you know, there was some, some minor seal leakage, and then you can record what was done to replace it and to repair it. Then you have an event display. So you can look at the events that occurred. You can look at where they occurred. 
uh, and then you can identify any particular device or tag. And here you have the tag number, the manufacturer, the model, uh, the serial number, and then if the proof test was done and whatever the revision. So it's useful to be able to document and look at these events on a time basis. And then you can assess the implications or further action that needs to be taken to either correct uh, or replace any devices. So, if we look at the benefits of an automated recording system, it enables detailed analysis of failures. So you can look at specific tag references, specific devices, specific device types for a specific SIF, and you'll be able to look at that in, and analyze the impact on performance. You can look at, you can have benefit of actually reducing false scripts because your proof test procedures are, are defined, your proof test is is uh, generated, you've got an automated proof test generation, so the, the chances of, of doing something wrong have been minimized. You've got the ability to compare your actual versus expected performance, and you have the ability to ensure that the risk reduction is adequate. So. Again, from the ALARP, when you did the, the hazard analysis, you're looking at as, as, as low as reasonably practical for your risk reduction. So this will tell you if your risk reduction is adequate. It will also tell you or enable you to identify if your risk reduction is inadequate. As well as if your risk reduction is more than adequate. Because if you have more risk reduction than you actually need, it can be costing you more money. <coughs> so it's always good to be able to know that your, your original risk reduction targets and your risk reduction um, assumptions and assessments were correct and that you are meeting them. It also helps provide data for future safety life cycle tasks. For example, any future risk assessments or when you come back to do your layer protection analysis most companies either have a three or a five year uh, policy to go back and, and redo the LOPAs, uh, your SIL target selection, or your SIL verification. The, the beauty of uh, the SILSTAT tool is that it can feed back into the Excellencia tool so that you'll be able to use the results to recalculate the SIL uh, for the particular SIFs to see whether or not that's changed. <coughs> or been affected by any maintenance or updates. Gives you the ability to re-evaluate the frequency of proof tests if needs be. And it also helps you communicate between client departments because operations, maintenance, process safety, reliability and engineering may all have different, uh, different remits in terms of what's expected. Whereas this way you have the right data in the right place in the right format that they can all have access to. And that well, is important because communication across departments or divisions is, is often an issue. So just to summarize, there is of course a need to manage risk, not ignore it. And, a, and a, an important part of that is making sure that you have a well laid out and structured mechanical integrity program or safety program that complies with the O&M requirements of IEC 615.11. Adopting an appropriate safety first culture is essential and this means that having trained and competent O&M personnel is paramount. Most of the life cycle time is spent in the operation phase and so therefore it's very important to make sure that all the people are adequately and properly trained to be able to maintain and operate their SIS safely. Having proper operator and maintenance procedures is also essential. Developing a safety checklist to ensure consistency. I like to use the analogy of the pilots. You may have a pilot that has hundreds of hours of flight time but every time he gets in that cockpit, 
he always goes through his pre-flight safety checklist just so he makes sure that he doesn't leave anything to memory. So having a good safety checklist to ensure consistency is very important. Undertake regular employee competency assessments. It's very important to make sure that the ONM personnel are trained, but also that they are competent. Make sure the proof testing is conducted in line with the SRS. As mentioned earlier, the SRS shouldn't be tucked away in some manager's office. It needs to be part of the operation and maintenance uh, suite of documentation, whether that's incorporated as part of a mechanical integrity program or, or a process safety management program, it needs to be there. Record all maintenance activities accurately and faithfully. It's very important such that you have good data, good plant data. Use software tools to assist in recording or auditing and use software tools to help analyze failures, faults, trips and actual SIS performance. Very important. That's a very important requirement of IEC 615.11. And keep plant personnel and, plants and the plants safe by following the operation and maintenance requirements and ensuring that you document everything correctly. So that covers the requirements of the ONM or IC 615.11, and so now I will open it up to any questions. One question says, does the proof test of the shutdown valve involved in a SIF should it include the seat leakage or just a stroke test or visual inspection is enough? Again, I would refer back to the manufacturer's safety manual. They will, they, they, that should state exactly what you need to do in order to make sure that you have, uh, you carry out an adequate proof test. Just looking at this, I would say that the seat leakage should be checked because that may have uh, have an effect on the, the overall PFD average for the SIF. <coughs> another question. Yeah, this, this question is in relation, it says that there's a lot of reports on proof testing of the final elements, um, but what about the proof testing typically carried out on the sensing elements? I, I, uh, I can see the, 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 the relevance of this. As I mentioned earlier, the, the weakest link in the chain tends to be the final elements because of the nature of the beast and the proof test coverage. So usually the safe failure fraction, if you're using the <coughs> safe failure fraction, the safe failure fraction is, is lower than, than certainly the, um, the sensing devices and the, uh, and the logic solver. Now, of course, that depends on the sensing devices, whether they're type A or type B. But proof testing on the sensing devices is typically easier and not as involved for, for type A's. But I, I always, when I, when I teach the functional safety engineering class, my, my, my point I always make, and I can't make it strongly enough, is that you have to follow the manufacturer's uh, safety manual in terms of what proof testing you need to do and how to carry it out. That's very important. So there isn't necessarily a one-fit-all. <coughs> 